do happen in this world. Randy's been delayed, so we've decided to move to our next speaker, and all of our speakers are wonderful. Randy will just be in another place when he gets here. I would like to introduce Jesse Shell, and for many of you that have been interested or looked at gaming, you know that Jesse is absolutely amazing. He's one of those out-of-the-box thinkers that I found intriguing. He's from Carnegie Mellon. He also has his own company called Shell Games. But the thing I want you to take away, what this whole conference is about is inspiration. And Jesse is a way of thinking outside of the box and really inspiring. So I want to give, have you give a hand for Jesse Shell. Hey, good morning, everybody. I just realized I've got the, uh, I don't know if I, I, I've got the right title on my slide here, but that's all right. We'll just, we'll just go. It's going to be, it's going to be magical. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about me, it's, just you understand it. So I, I run a, a video game studio in Pennsylvania. We, uh, we're, the, we're the largest game studio in Pennsylvania with 65 people. We do a mixture of uh, entertainment and education. And more and more we find ourselves doing education because that really is the fastest growing part of the game industry at this point. It's 90% it's of what we do. I also teach at Carnegie Mellon University at the Entertainment Technology Center. I've been teaching there for about 10 years or so. People who uh, know of Randy Pausch from uh, uh, either from the last lecture or from his virtual reality research, he was one of the founders uh, of that place. And it's a very interesting place because it's all about bringing together artists and engineers and teaching them how to make things for industry that uh, they couldn't make by themselves. I used to be the creative director of the virtual reality studio at Walt Disney Imagineering. And uh, a great deal of what I learned, I learned there. And I wrote a book called The Art of Game Design that's been, that's been somewhat popular. So what I wanted to talk to you uh, about today was about characters. There's, there's lots of talk about worlds, but I wanted to focus a little bit on characters because when I look at the next 10 years or so um, and think about what is it that's going to make the biggest difference, what's going to change the most in the, in the coming 10 years, I really do think it is characters in virtual worlds. And specifically, I think there are a lot of changes that are coming, and we're going to see them in the video game space first. But even though we see them there first, I think they're going to, uh, they're going to creep out, and they're going, to, they're going to matter in all kinds of fields, all kinds of applications. One thing I will point you to, if you are interested in video game characters, this book, Better Characters by Design, by Catherine Isbister, is, is really an excellent book, because what she does is she takes a lot of great psychological research, and she combines it with what's well known in the field of video games to sort of show um, how to create characters that people are going to find engaging and compelling. So necessarily for this, we're going to need to predict the future uh, a little bit. And a lot of people kind of shy away from that. And I find as with each year that goes by, people become more and more afraid of predicting the future because things get so complicated. Things are, new technologies are coming at us so fast that, that, that it, it becomes difficult to even keep up, right? A thousand years ago, it was easy to predict technologies 50 years in the future. But nowadays, predicting 18 months from now seems almost impossible. So a lot of people just give up. And it makes us what I call future blind. And the great advantage you can have is if you actually spend time making concrete predictions about the future, you can get better at it if you practice and you try. Because the good thing about all these new technologies coming fast is you get great feedback. If you make a concrete prediction about, you know what, you know, I just had someone, so I have this website I run called crystalballsociety.com where I get people to make little video predictions. And I just had someone send one in last night. They're predicting that the mouse will no longer be the dominant a mode of interface by the year 2015. And then we put those up on the website, and then we can kind of see, you know, in three years from now, we'll know. Is that a good prediction, a bad prediction? Why? So in that spirit, I'll be making some predictions today. So looking back at the history of virtual characters is, is pretty interesting. If you go back to the 1800s, this was a kind of a famous virtual character. His name was the Mechanical Turk. And it was a chess playing machine. And it was an amazing machine. It would travel from town to town in Europe, and they would, you know, they'd, they'd say, bring out your best, they'd visit a town, and they'd say, bring out your best chess player. And the Mechanical Turk could beat everybody. 
It was a machine that could beat everyone, and everyone was amazed by it. Now, it turns out the way the Turk seems to have worked um, was that down here inside, you can see some mechanicals here, but the owner would never open all the doors at once. He would open the doors to show the mechanicals inside, then he'd close that door and slide another mechanical. And anyway, hidden inside was enough room for an incredibly skilled chess-playing dwarf to <laughs> reside inside. Um, but the cabinet was so small, it didn't seem like a person could be in there. Well, uh, anyway, the interesting part is not so much that there was a chess-playing dwarf, but more to the fact that they felt it necessary to have a character on the top. It could have just been the amazing chess-playing box, but they, they felt the need to kind of put a human figure up there because they knew that people would connect to it and relate to it uh, better. Um, this is a picture of my grandfather, um, Dr. Emil Schell. And uh, he, he was an interesting character in his own right. And uh, he may have created the very first uh, computer game. He used to work uh, here in Washington. One of his responsibilities was bringing the, uh, the ENIAC computer uh, from University of Pennsylvania to the Pentagon when the government had purchased it. And you can imagine it takes a while to put something like that back together. And so he wrote some test programs. And one of them was uh, the ancient game of, of NIM. Uh, which is an ancient Egyptian game. And part of what's cool about Nim is if you know a certain trick, you can win every time. And he just taught that trick to ENIAC. And it was great because it, it made all the generals think, wow, this is really, look at this, it just beat me at a strategy game. This thing must be pretty smart. And, and again, it was a case of people wanting, pe wanting this notion of the computer to kind of be alive and be thinking. So there's been a lot of interesting things happening in the world of virtual characters. And I'm going to show you some things from kind of the world of puppetry. I don't know if people have been to Disney World lately, but there have been some changes in the way the characters work. So check out this Mickey Mouse here. Hopefully we'll have some audio. Up there. Aww. Thank you. Three years old? Wow. Hi, Madison. I like your princess shirt. Oh, my goodness. Oh my. Right? So, you know, kind of moving to this world where physical characters have, like, moving mouths and blinking eyes is kind of an interesting change. And it's, I've always been fascinated looking at kids interacting with these characters because while, you know, to, on some level they're incredibly drawn to them, on another level they're a little uncomfortable. <laughs> right? And they're partly uncomfortable because, you know, they can kind of tell something's not quite right there. Something isn't, there's, you know, on, I think on some level they realize I'm being lied to. <laughs> but uh, people keep making advances with these characters. Here's another Disney, uh, uh, oh, actually, before we get to that one, let me, let me show you this. This is the uh, Quasi the Robot uh, interface. So this is a robot that was developed at Carnegie Mellon. It's lar largely designed to be a puppeteered robot, but, but check out some of this puppeteering interface. So the operator uses a, a stylus in order to control the camera and the head, and there's a tiny pinhole camera on the, uh, on the robot, so you can see from the robot's point of view. And that's kind of cool, and you can cock the head, and you can do, do these different things. Um, but what's really interesting is the emotional map that they put in. Each of those five faces represents a different emotional state for the character. And they're not just push buttons. There's a smooth blending from emotional state to emotional state as they, as they move, move through. And here's the Disney one I was mentioning. This is a Turtle Talk with Crush. Hand, hands up anyone who's seen this. This is, this is a little bit mind-blowing for people when they see it, because you go into a room and there's an anime, you know, it's, a, it's designed to look like an aquarium, but it's an animated screen. But then what's peculiar is the animated characters start to talk to the audience. Well, hey, Jason, dude. Yeah, what's up, Crush? Dude, ever on this movie about there's a dude in, like, a swirly-looking shell? Yeah, this like, guy right here. Kind of looks like seawater, did not Yeah, shawl. What's your name, dude? Alex. Oh, dude, I'm going to call you A-Frame. Talk. Hey, so A-Frame, do you, do you know how to talk like a turtle? No. 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 Well, dude, no worries, dude. I will teach you. And on A-Frame, dude, can you say totally? Totally. Good, dude. Can you say sweet? Okay, can you put the two words together, dude, and say them really loud? No. Oh, I don't want to. Aww. 
Oh, dude, we say I don't want to in Turtle 2. <laughs> John, hey, you dudes, everybody help him out, dude. Say, totally sweet. Totally sweet. So awesome, dude. Now you're all talking Turtle, dude. You guys are like bilingual. <laughs> And so, you know, you see families going here, and, you know, mom and dad are exhausted, and the kids are looking at this thing, and then the next thing, you, the parents are like, wait, what's going on? Is there, the, how are these characters actually talking um, to my kids? And people are really compelled by this. So I talk about this puppeteering stuff because it, it partly proves out that there's, people are interested in being able to interact directly with these characters, and, and these ones that kind of have the, you know, Wizard of Oz man behind the curtain, are a good hint at what's coming in the future. So I'm going to, I'm going to whip through talking about 10 technologies today that I think are going to make a huge difference for virtual characters in the, in the coming years. So the first one is facial expression tracking. And this, this little video speaks for itself here. Using a program called Face API, it's possible to track a person's facial features using nothing more than a standard web camera. In turn, we can use this information to drive the expression of a virtual character, such as Breen here, taken from the game Half-Life 2. This technology could allow players to accurately portray themselves online for use in multiplayer games or socializing applications. If you're interested in learning more about this technology or other related work I've done, please check out my website. So what I find fascinating about this is partly, I mean, it's, it's not a complicated technology. It's, it's just driven by Moore's Law and, the, and, and how many cameras we have, and we're having more cameras all the time. So it'll be easy to imagine this sort of thing woven into things like World of Warcraft so that the character you have, you know, that when you meet someone else's character in the game, it'll map their real expression. But I really believe this technology is going to creep out of the world of video games into the world of video conferencing. Because we've all experienced, you know, how, how many people are now using Skype on a regular basis for some kind of, right? Lots of people are using it. And, and it's generally dissatisfactory in many cases. There, it has a lot of problems. Um, one of the problems is the eye contact problem. If you're looking at the camera, you're not looking at the person. So you can see right here, she's looking down, but she's not really looking down. She's really trying to make eye contact here, but <clears throat> because the camera's up here, it looks like she's looking down. She's making eye contact, but that's because she's looking at the camera. She can't actually see this person because she's looking at the camera, not at the screen. So that's lousy. If you replaced these real video images with a virtual copy of yourself, it would be easy to make an adjustment. And then further, we're all a little uncomfortable about using these video conference things. It's supposed to approximate face-to-face, -face, but it's not natural like face-to-face, -face, and you feel much more uncomfortable than you do when you're on the phone, because there's this feeling that like, yeah, they can see me, but it doesn't feel right. Is there something, is my hair okay? You know, you worry about that in a way you wouldn't worry about face to face. If you had an avatar up there, you wouldn't worry about that because the avatar is the avatar, it's not you, and it would kind of give you a little bit of a shielding. And it won't surprise me at all if we start to have um, sort of our little work avatars that we start to use for, uh, for these video conferencing applications because it will end up feeling more natural and more comfortable. Now, some people say, no, that's, no, that's, look, I've tried to use those little animated camera things, and they, they stink. And that's true right now. Um, but I think this is a case of uh, uh, what Clay Christensen talks about in The Innovator's Dilemma. And I really do think this is one of the most important books uh, of the last couple decades in terms of thinking about technology. Um, hands up, are people familiar with this? Okay, so a number of people are, but some, some aren't. So I just want to talk about the key idea here, because it has a lot of relevance for us. The core of the book, uh, Christensen's premise, is that um, product performance improves over time. Well, that seems pretty natural. Something comes out, and then later versions of it get better. Well, that's natural, and we all know that. Um, but what he's addressing, actually, just to go back to this for his, uh, you know, you see his subtitle here, when new technologies cause great firms to fail. Because his observation is that this happens all the time. Big companies that were very successful get blown out of the water by some new technology. They just get destroyed by it. And the conventional wisdom is, well, those big companies are stupid, and that's why. But that doesn't make any sense. How'd they get so big if they're so stupid? And he realized the problem. The problem that the big companies have where they keep getting knocked down by some little startup, and then that little startup gets big and it gets knocked down, the problem is they make a fatal mistake 
And that mistake is listening to their customers. And that sounds backwards, because of course you should listen to your customers. But this, this graph shows the problem. So if you've got product performance over here, over time, um, a typical situation is you've got a product that's successful, and you ask your customers, what should we do? And they say, well, you know, you should make it better. And OK, okay sure. And so that's why things keep getting better. But he points out that there are two lines here. There's a lower line here, which is, you know, if it's below this line, this product is so lousy that people just really don't want it, and it's not going to succeed in the marketplace. And then there's this line here at the top that people don't think about as much. If it's, if it's above this line, it has features I don't need anymore. Like, oh my god, a million billion gigahertz? Look, I'm just, I'm just sending email. I'm just, I don't need your complicated stuff, right? And so a very typical situation is you've got a product successful. Hey, what should we do? And, you, and the customers say, make it better. So you make it better. And, and then you say, what about now? And they say, well, you should make it better. And so you make it better. And then you say, hey, hey, customers, I just want to ask. This new thing has come out down here. We're thinking about, should we do one of these? And the customers say, no, that thing stinks. I don't want any. Look, it doesn't do what I need. Don't, I'm like, OK, fine, fine, all right. We'll just make our thing better, and we'll make our thing better. Hey, customers, what should we do now? And they're like, you know, I really don't care what you do, because I'm buying one of these. And we're like, what? I just asked you about that. I just asked you. And they say, well, I didn't know it was going to have a touch screen, and I didn't know it was going to, you know. And, then, and, and these guys are stuck up here, and no one wants to buy their thing because they've crossed these lines. And so being aware of when a disruptive technology is, is coming out and where these lines are is crucial to being able to figure out what's coming next. So a lot of times, things that look lousy now end up actually being really important. Like App Apple, for example, they had the Newton, and everyone hated it. So they're like, you know what, you're right, let's get out of this market. And then Palm just went and took it. And, and, they, and, they, and they're like, oh, maybe we should have waited until we crossed the line. OK, second technology is persistent databases. Now, this is, in, in the world of video games, we've started to have persistent databases. That's the power of games like World of Warcraft. The fact that every time you log in, it remembers where you were the last time you played, and you can have a world that grows and grows and grows. And we have this for worlds, but what we don't have is we don't have this for characters. Because in a lot of ways, we think of our, the characters in our video games, they're kind of like our friends. But Mario, Mario is a terrible friend. He's, he's really bad. I go out and I buy a new, you know, Mario game for the Wii, and I put it in the drive, and I, and I, I put it in, and he's like, you know, hey, it's me, Mario! And I'm like, man, I, dude, I know, it's, I know it's you. And then he says, enter your name! And I'm like, Mario, what are you doing? I, I, you and I have been together for like 30 years. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't you remember we met at that pizza place in New Jersey, you know? And, and you know, we, you and me, we took on Donkey Kong. You know, it took six weeks and like a hundred quarters, but we did it. And, and that isn't all. We've been doing stuff for years. We've been playing golf and we had all those adventures and we rescued the princess like 50 times. And you don't remember any of it. That's, that's, that's a terrible friend, right? But that's because the memory is all based on worlds. It's not based on characters. It's not a big jump, once everything starts to be up in the cloud, to have characters that remember from game to game. So that when I get the new Mario game, you know, he doesn't say, it's a me, Mario. He says, it's a you, Jesse. Right? And maybe he even has little video clips of our previous adventures. You know, there's no reason these characters can't have a long memory that goes from world to world to world. So when I was young, I was maybe seven years old, and I was on a long car ride with my father. And it's quiet, we're just driving along, and all of a sudden he says, if you had a friend who was a ghost, how old would you want them to be? And I thought about it, and I said, well, you know, I guess, I guess I'd want it to be my age, so we could play. And he said, yeah. But the thing is, you'll get older, 
and he won't. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess I didn't think about that. And he said, yeah, that's why you've got to think about these things. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> that bothered me for a long time, but now I think I, I understand some value in it. Um, because that's true with these characters. You know, people are going to start with these characters when they're a certain age. And as they grow up, the characters are going to need to grow and change with them. And persistent databases are going to be part of what makes that possible. Because we know that people have this kind of persistence that they want. Most people, when they first choose like a username or a handle or a login, when they're about 15, end up keeping it for the rest of their lives. It's like part of their identity. And this character development and the characters that you choose when you're younger are going to be characters you're going to want with you when you're older, as, as long as they change with you. If they don't change with you, you're going to discard them like paper cups. So the third technology I'll talk about is uh, speech recognition. This is just a little comic here all about the, you know, the Xbox now supports speech recognition and people, people get kind of a power trip from it. It's kind of exciting, you know, you, you're like, Xbox, open tray, and zzz, the little tray goes out and you're like, yeah, of course, then you got to get up off the couch and go put the disc in. I mean, it didn't, didn't really help that much, but um, this is starting to become part of games. And so you can see, here's a little clip from Mass Effect 3, um, and this was a little demo they showed at E3 2011, and they, they took some interesting steps in terms of uh, voice recognition. One survivor left, though. Need to get her off world. She's still here? Yes. Placed her in protective isolation. Recommend gentle approach. Krogan slope trust. I don't need her trust. I'm Commander Shepard, Alliance Navy. Are you here to kill me? Of course not. We're here to take you home. Why? What am I to you? You're the Krogan's last hope. You're the future of the Krogan race. I'm fighting for that. Then I hope you brought an army. Alert. Unidentified vessels have breached the room. But this isn't just about choosing dialogue. You're fighting for the very survival of the universe. In combat, Connect grants you a crazy new level of coordination and strategic control, which allows you to fluidly launch tactical assaults against your enemies. Liara, move up. Garrus, move up. We are a singularity. So you can see they have an interesting blend there of using uh, the both for both for spoken word dialogue and for um, control with, within the game. I mean, this is this is now an off-the-shelf product that you buy at, at Walmart. Now, Chris Swain, he's a professor at USC, he made a very interesting prediction that, that stayed with me um, because I, I really do think that it's a good analogy and I think it's true. He, he talked about where video games are and where they're going. And he, he makes an argument that film overtook literature in the 20th century. And, and as he says it, film became the literature of, of the 20th century. But he didn't do it at first, right, because at first we had silent films. And silent films were considered just kind of an amusement, you know, something, something kind of for the kids, sort of, sort of silly, nothing anybody took very seriously. But then they learned to, to talk, right? And there's the jazz singer, the first talking motion picture. And everything changed. It completely changed our culture. It changed all of Hollywood. And it made television possible. And, and, and suddenly, vi you know, video became the dominant medium uh, by which we learn about the world and by which we communicate. So Chris argues that games are undergoing a similar transformation. Right now, people consider them kind of a silly thing, kind of for kids, kind of, for, kind of trivial, not very important. Well, do they need to learn to talk? They already talk. And he's like, yeah, that's not the problem. What they need to do is they need to learn to listen. And that once games can listen, so that you can have a meaningful conversation with a video game character, everything changes. This is now an insanely powerful medium. And his argument is that once games learn to do this, they will become the dominant medium of the 21st century. 
This was a story that kind of intrigued me. This was something that happened with a, uh, something, a story a student told me. Um, there's these Forgotten Realms books. It's like a fantasy series. And there's a popular character, this character named Drizzt, who's a dark elf. He's kind of this, he's kind of the bad guy, good guy kind of, kind of character. And the, this student was telling me a story about how he was playing a Forgotten Realms game one day. And in the game, uh, at one point you meet Drist and you have this conversation with Drist. And, and his roommate walks in just then. And his roommate's like, oh man, is that Drist? And he said, well, well, well yeah, why do, why do you care? You, you never play games. You hate games. He's like, yeah, no, I hate games. But, but man, I, I, you know, I've read some of these books. and Could I, could I play for a bit? It's like, why, why do you want to play? You hate these games. Yeah, I know, but I've always wanted to meet that guy. <laughs> right? And that's, that's part of what can be magic in these, in these games, is that the idea that you can meet these characters and they can have a certain tangibility. So the fourth technology is natural language understanding. It's one thing to be able to understand the words, but it's something else entirely to be able to make sense of, uh, of, of the conversation and to kind of give conversation back. So this is some dialogue from the ELISA program that was created in uh, about 1970 and it really blew people's minds back then. It, it's kind of a simple trick. It, it just does little lexical tricks to sort of make you think it understands uh, when, it, when it really doesn't. And there's a picture of Alan Turing there and many people are familiar with the notion of the Turing test that he proposed which was that you know, computers will be considered intelligent when you can't tell the difference between a conversation with a, a computer and a conversation with a human. And this, this notion of the Turing test has caused a lot of people to say, oh boy, these, we're, we're, um, we're millions of miles away from being able to have an intelligent conversation with a computer. But I, I think it misleads us sometimes. Because while it's true that it may be quite difficult for a computer to perfectly mimic a human, there are a lot of other things in between. If you had a computer that could mimic uh, C-3PO from the Star Wars movies or Data from Star Trek, they're not humans and they have weaknesses and failings, but geez, they sure would be interesting to talk to. So uh, we, we may be closer to being able to have interesting conversations with, uh, with devices than, than we realize. I want to say a few words about text adventures because it's an interesting thing. People, you know, we, text adventures was a big thing in the 80s. It was a big business and, and it was exciting. It was like a, a book that you could interact with. And then that all poof went away. It just, it, it didn't become marginalized. It was gone. They don't, they, none were produced for, for decades. And people said, well, that's just because graphics got better and we just moved on to things with graphics. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense because why wouldn't you have graphics and text? Because text lets you interact in such a powerful way. And I think the real reason text adventures went away is there is a key frustration that was built into them. They, 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 they lie to you in a certain way, right? Here's the beginning of Zork and you know, you're west of the house, there's a small mailbox and this little prompt says, you may now type anything, which feels incredibly powerful, but you quickly learn you can't type anything. There's only a small subset of things that the game actually understands. And so you spend about two-thirds of your time, you know, trying things that the game can't comprehend at all. And it feels very fake and it feels very broken. But we're starting to get past that. When you look at games like Scribble Knots, I don't know if people have tried this game on the Nintendo DS, it's terrifying. You, you don't do a lot of text entry in this game. The notion of this game is you're presented with a problem, you know, like you need to cross this river and your input is a text prompt. And they're like, type anything and it will appear. And you're like, yeah, sure. All right, I'll type bridge. And then poof, a bridge appears and you can cross the river, right? And you could type, well, what if I type bear? Well, suddenly a bear like appears, you know? Well, all right, what if I type God, right? Like God shows up, you know, and he's, he's looking around. And, and then if you type devil, the devil shows up and they have a fight. It, it has something like 30,000 different things. And it's, it's amazing. And the new version supports adjectives. So you can type angry bear or, or, or benevolent God or whatever. And again, with persistent databases, this stuff is going to stay. And, and it's going to get more and more powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just pass that video there because we talked about it. Um, so the next one here, emotion sensing. Um, 
So we talked about the ability to kind of just project your facial features, but what about when we get to the point